I'm Dr. Cheskis, Medical Director, Sunnybrook Osler Center for Pre-Hospital Medicine. Uh, we're going to give a little talk today on perishock pause, an independent predictor of survival from out of hospital cardiac arrest. This was a paper that the, uh, the Resuscitation Outcomes Consortium, myself as lead investigator, recently published in circulation. And what we hope to get people to learn today out of this talk is what are the practical applications? So what can paramedics take away from this research and actually use in everyday pre-hospital care? Um, just a little bit of background. So most people may not even understand what a perishock pause is. So a perishock pause is a pause just prior to and just following defibrillatory shock. So the pre-shock pause occurs before you provide a shock and the post-shock pause occurs after the shock is delivered. And the perishock pause is essentially the combination of those two particular times. A number of researchers in the past have already looked at the relationship between shock pauses and a number of different outcomes. But the primary outcomes in the other research done have been termination of VF and VT and return of spontaneous circulation. No one prior to our study has looked at the relationship of shock pause to survival to hospital discharge. So that's essentially what we did in our particular study and these are the results that we hope to show you today. In this diagram that you see here, what you'll notice is a defibrillator tracing showing pictorially what a pre and post shock pause is. What you'll see on the bottom is a CPR waveform in the impedance channel. What you'll notice there is a pre shock pause is a time when CPR stops to shock delivery. The post shock pause is a time between shock delivery and resumption of CPR. So you can see that in the CPR waveform in this particular diagram. The peri-shock pause is a combination of the two. The background of our study is really to examine the relationship, therefore, between these peri-shock pauses and survival to hospital discharge. Our hypothesis was that longer peri-shock pauses were going to be associated with a lowering in survival to discharge. We really felt, based on the literature out there, that Pauses in cardiac arrest resuscitation we know are bad. So pauses in CPR usually relate to poor outcomes. What we were thinking though was that the pauses related to actual shock delivery may in fact be the worst sources of danger to the particular patient. So this is why we focused on the peri-shock pause interval. In our study we included all cardiac arrests from the rock epistry between about approximately two year time frame. The patients had to present in VFVT they had to have CPR process data for at least one shock. We excluded EMS witness arrest and any patients who didn't have survival to outcome data for a particular study. The data collection occurred at five sites across North America. Interesting for Vancouver, who are part of the group that I'm doing this little talk for, that they were the largest uh, contributor to the database for a particular trial. From all the data we had, we calculated individual pre and post shock pauses from each of the CPR process files. I then independently reviewed a subsection of these trials to ensure accuracy uh, in the recording of the data. What we did once we had our data was then do a statistical analysis that looked at the relationship between shock pause and survival to discharge. What we also did then was correct for a variety of factors known to impact survival from out of hospital cardiac arrest, such as bystander CPR, EMS witness CPR, ALS arrival. We did a model looking at different categorical pause lengths, so pause lengths of less than 10 seconds, 10 to 20 seconds, and greater than 20 seconds, and also a second model that looked at the relationship between survival and shock pause as a continuous variable. So that basically means that for every X seconds of shock pause, what would the impact be on survival to discharge? So our results of our trial were as follows. What you can see here in our study cohort and our exclusions, we looked at patients, we looked at almost 4,000 shocks delivered, almost 2,500 pre and post shock pause intervals. Just to give people an idea of previous research in this area, the most patients that had been previously looked at was about 80 to 90 patients. Uh, we looked at over 800 patients in our data and the number of shock pause intervals we looked at was greater than any previous research in this particular field. You can see here on this particular plot, it's an interesting diagram. What it looks at is the length of pre and post shock pause intervals with the number of shocks. And what you can see, other than that top, um, 
the, uh, the top line is a gradual decrease in shock pause length with a length of resuscitation. And when you think of it intuitively, this makes sense. When paramedics first come to the scene of a cardiac arrest, they're oftentimes doing a variety of things, starting intravenous, looking at an airway, intubating, dealing with family. There's a lot of activity at the scene which tends to decrease the quality of CPR. But once an IV, an endotracheal tube is in place and they get the sequence of CPR, the shock pause lengths tend to improve with time and that's what we've seen in this particular diagram. Here is one of, our, uh, one of our very important findings, is basically the look at shock pause and percent of patients who survive. So this looked at these two variables without correction for other uh, cardiac arrest associated factors that impact survival. And what you can see at the pre and post shock pause lengths is that once you got over 20 seconds, survival significantly dropped off. When you look at the peri shock pause length, when you got over 40 seconds, the survival significantly dropped off with a significant improvement for survival with lowering pre and post shock lengths. This diagram here is a bit of a, a tricky one. It's one where we did our adjusted calculation. What I mean by that is not only did we look at shock pause length and survival to discharge, but we now corrected for those variables that improve that are known to impact cardiac arrest resuscitation outcomes. Um, the key factor will actually be on the next slide in terms of what we want to show. The key intervals that we found in our study that were statistically significant were the following. For patients with pre-shock pauses greater than 20 seconds, when compared to pre-shock pause less than 10 seconds, there was a statistically significant decrease in survival to discharge. We as well noticed that for patients with peri-shock pauses greater than 40 seconds, when compared to those patients who had peri-shock pauses less than 20 seconds. We found that the benefit of peri-shock pause shortening was driven almost exclusively by a lowering of the pre-shock pause length. Interestingly enough, post-shock pause had no impact whatsoever on survival to hospital discharge in our particular study, and this was quite different from what has been found in previous studies. When we did our log linear model, looking at a change in survival with respect to time, we found a 15% decrease in survival to discharge for every five second increase in both pre and peri-shock pause interval. Interestingly, the post-shock pining, although not statistically significant, was in fact showing a 2% increase in survival for longer post-shock pause lengths. So I'd be very careful because the post-shock finding, post-shock pause finding was not statistically significant. Our study had a number of limitations. We had some missing data, um, so we had about 26% of our pause data was missing. And this relates to the fact that when you're doing cardiac recess, arrest resuscitation and you applied defibrillator pads to the patient, it actually, we miss a period of time when CPR is ongoing until the defibrillator pads are going on. So that first shock pause interval is often very difficult to calculate. Our study is an observational study. It is not a randomized controlled trial, so we cannot prove causality based on an observational study. But based on our research, as well as the research done in other jurisdictions, it would be very hard to do a randomized controlled trial that asks people to increase their shock pause duration. We did not correct in our study for pre-shock compression depth and compression rate, and I think that would be an interesting thing to look forward to in future trials. And we need to be sure that these, are, these studies took place in systems that were really optimized to deliver quality care. So many of the sites here do very good CPR, have very short response times. The question is, in other jurisdictions when response times and quality of care is not quite as good, will these findings hold up? Essentially, therefore, our conclusions were longer peri-shock pauses and longer pre-shock pauses were associated with decreases in survival to hospital discharge. What are the implications, therefore, for paramedics doing cardiac arrest resuscitations? So what we try to teach our paramedics is they need to minimize all shock, pause, um, all shock pauses 
uh, that are very long in length. Uh, this follows where we want paramedics to minimize interruptions in CPR, but when those interruptions occur around the delivery of shock, I think you can really impact uh, survival, to out, uh, survival to hospital discharge. We try to make paramedics, or now we're trying to have our trained paramedics work in manual mode as opposed to AED mode. The reason for this is in AED mode, the amount of time it takes a defibrillator to analyze the underlying rhythm and charge up to shock is significantly longer than that in manual mode. And I think in our study, we found in AED mode, our pre-shock pause was approximately 18 seconds while it was only 10 seconds in manual mode. So we're trying now to ensure that all trained paramedics work in manual mode to decrease their pre-shock pause. If one needs to work in AED mode, we're trying to stress the concept of compressions during charging. What that means is that when an AED defibrillator begins an analysis and then confirms that a shockable rhythm is in place, we wish our paramedics and firefighters to resume CPR until a shock is ready to be delivered, hands off the chest, deliver the shock, and then resume CPR. Therefore, by doing compressions during charging, we can not only improve chest compression fraction, but decrease pre-shock pause. I hope everyone's enjoyed this particular talk on our paper, and I hope that you're able to use the findings of our research while you provide care to resuscitation uh, to cardiac arrest victims uh, in the future. I thank you for your time and I hope you enjoy the show.